let's uh, let's talk about the future of dentistry. Should we start off with a coronavirus update? Um, so you guys are probably, um, what is the average age of everybody in that room? 25, probably 22 to 28. Is that about the range? Ba basically, um, the advantage of old dogs like me is um, I've been practicing for 32 years. So I, I've seen everything multiple times. It's, uh, I don't think I've seen anything new lately. Um, right now, the coronavirus is um, grabbing a lot of attention, and I just want to say there's so many different ways we can talk about this, but one is um, I want to talk about your future, buying a dental practice, things like that. Imagine if you owned uh, a dental office, and every day you walked out of your dental office, a DSO uh, guy was in the parking lot and he said, hey, I'll give you $750,000 for your office, and it doesn't change anything. You have your dental office. The next day, you walk out, and he says, I'll give you a million. Today he's walking out there saying, I'll give you 500,000. So if you, you know, the, the bottom line is just because you can get a price on an asset every day, it has really no bearings on the long-term fundamental aspects of, of the, uh, what you're buying. You're going to practice dentistry from age 25 to 65. So in 40 years, you're going to see a lot. I graduated from high school in 1980. That was the largest economic contraction that I've ever lived through. I mean, it was crazy. Interest rates were 21%. Inflation and unemployment were double digit. Um, I had three friends in high school where their dad had lost a family farm that had been held in generations that went out in the barn and killed themselves. Uh, Paul Volcker, the Fed chairman, had to have armed service guards. That was the worst. And then I graduated from dental school, UMKC in 87 in May. And October was Black Monday, this market fell a quarter. And then there was Y2K. You guys probably remember Y2K because that's the year 2000. It's 2020, you were probably you know, maybe two or three years old. That was a bad one. And then we had another one, Lehman's Day, 2008. So right now we're just in another market contraction. So markets expand and markets contract. And that's just how economics works. And I think this is really, really good for you. I think there's no better lesson than for you to come out of dental school. $400,000 in debt is what I'm hearing. Uh, I know the um, associations of dental schools say that the average student loan indebtedness is 287. But I think that's an intentional misrepresentation because they know 20% of the students don't have any debt. Their parents are paying for it. Um, so the bottom line, if, um, if you look at the people that actually are borrowing student loan money, it's about 100000 a year. So if you come out of school, $400,000 in student loans, you, you borrowed so much of other people's money that you got to ask yourself, what, was it a good decision? I think it was a great decision because the long-term fundamental aspects of dentistry have been amazing um, ever since the start. Let's go back to the United States, 1900 healthcare wasn't even 1% of the GDP. By the end of the century, 2000, it was 14% of the GDP. Dentists had nine specialties and physicians had 58. And then um, now it's 2020, we see healthcare at 17% of the GDP and dentistry's added a couple more um, specialties, dental anesthesiology, oral medicine. So what, what can we learn from that trend? Well, first of all, why would healthcare be the fastest growing segment of the society in economics for the last uh, two centuries? Um, it's very simple. I, I like to define it down to a blue pill. Um, you always need to find a question at the base of the root so you don't have to discuss all the stuff up in the leaves. And the bottom line is the, the blue pill is, let's say that you were going to die tonight and your only option was to buy this blue pill from me. And if you take the blue pill, you won't die. So how much would you pay for that pill? Well, you will find that people will give you their house, their car, they'll, they'll give you everything they can not to die. So that shows you that the only true wealth is health. Now let's go to dentistry. Dentistry mixes medicine and the psychology of how you're going to look, which is extremely important because um, the reason they say you're pretty as a peacock is because the number one goal of a species is simply to reproduce and have offspring. So if you walk up to any girl in dental school and say, hey, I'll pay off all your student loans if you let me pull your front tooth and you can never replace it the rest of your life. How many girls in the class would do that? In fact, I would actually fly down there and pay off your student loans. I, I could actually do this. Do I have any takers? Any girls in the class? 
Raise your hand if you definitely would not do that. Raise your hand if you're surfing Facebook and don't even know what I'm talking about. So the bottom line is it's real simple. Um, the importance of teeth is just off the charts. Um, only 5% of Americans will ever see a chiropractor. 100% of the world's 8 billion people will all see one of the world's 2 million dentists at one time in their life. So we know that the true health, health is uh, wealth. We know that it's been specializing. We know that it's been taking a bigger chunk of the economy. And so what, what have we learned? What, what are some of the things that you should um, know uh, and hold dear to you and not ever forget because we're not going back in time. This explains why dental specialists make 320,000 a year and general dentists make 197 because we're not going back to 1900 where you're going to be a jack of all trades. I mean, my friends that do eyes, uh, you can ask them a question. They go, oh, you know, that's a retina question. I, I don't do retinas. There's guys that only do retinas. I mean, they, they've broken up the eyes, ears, nose, throat, uh, dentistry has 11. Who makes the most money? Oral and maxillofacial surgeons. Again, a doctor, a surgery, um, is uh, it's blood and guts. When people come out of dental school and they say, "I don't like, um, I don't like surgery. I don't like extractions. I don't like blood and guts." It's like, well, how the hell did you sign up for dental school? I mean, what did you think was inside people? I mean, um, you start listening to them, and, and it doesn't even make sense. Specialists make $100,000 a year more than general dentists, just like dentists who own their own practice make 244, dentists who are employees make 147. So you can learn today that you'll make $100,000 a year more. And think about that. If you graduate at 25, we're told 65, 40 years at $100,000 a year, that's $4 million without even uh, uh, um, uh, factoring in cost of capital investment, et cetera. Periodontists make 330. Now, now oral surgeons and periodontists, that's a lot of implantology. Um, Endo's 307. Pediatric dentistry, I guess if you're trying to prepare yourself for what it'd be like in health for eternity, you could be a pediatric dentist for 40 years on earth and listen to screaming kids. Um, but ortho, drops down to 289. So once you leave blood and guts, you've dropped below the $300,000 line. And um, prosthodontists at 219. Now I know that $400,000 seems like a lot of money to you, but I can assure you that everyone that I know who got divorced uh, paid over a million. My, my divorce cost me $3.8 million and I graduated $87,000 in student loans. So let me do the math real quick. Uh, three eight zero 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 three point eight million divided by my eighty seven thousand dollars of student loans. My dental school costs my divorce costs forty three times more than dental school. So it's not the amount of money; it's your emotional reaction to it. Just like the stock market's falling in a contraction, you know everybody says buy low and sell high. So I'm looking at all these dental stocks that have fallen thirty percent. That's the time to buy. But right now, no one will buy a stock. The sky's falling. Every time the housing market collapses, no one will buy a house. But man, when it starts doubling every year or two or three in a row, um, every, it goes crazy. So I would um, I would tell you that um, that you should specialize. If you go into general practice, you should again get a focus. And I would divide the focus up into uh, blood and guts. Either you're going to be an implantologist um, and do root canals and gum surgeries and all that, or you're going to go more the other fast sector, Invisalign, which is bleaching, bonding, veneers. Those are the two segments of the market that are growing in double digit. When you look at the dental economy, um, when you look at it globally, it's about um, it's about 129 billion in the United States. It's about a half a trillion for the planet. But when you look at that, um, when you look at the dental economy. Uh, from the dental manufacturers, they always tell you that they can divide up the world into thirds. Um, the United States, Canada is a third of all their dental supply cells and everything. So is Europe. And then so is the entire rest of the world. Um, Americans are big time into teeth. They're big time into beauty. And um, it's a, um, but when you look at those sectors, cleanings, exams, fillings, all that stuff, it's pretty flat. It's kind of like the U.S. economy. I got out of high school in 1980. 40 years later, the economy only grew one and a half to three and a half percent a year for four decades. That's what dentistry is doing. It's a very mature industry with the exception of implants and clear aligners, which are both growing double digit. So I would really um, have you take a look at those. Um, I want to switch to DSOs because I know 
they're going to be um, really trying to market and get your attention because they need a labor supply. In fact, what your behavior is showing has changed the business models of DSOs uh, for the whole time. And I, um, so, so one of the things is they're not going rural anymore. Anybody know why they're not going rural? Because you won't work there. Again, it goes to biology. If you come out of dental school and your biology says, I want to mate and I want to have a child and I want to reproduce and have offspring, it's hard to find a mate in Salina, Kansas if there's only 10,000 people and only seven of them are your age and single. So millennials like the big urban cities. So that's where the DSOs are going. I think the DSOs, um, and right now they're about, Oh, they're about 18% of dental supplies, but they're only about 12% of locations. But I think in the next 20 years, that's going to easily double um, where the urban areas are going to be at an absolute minimum 25% DSOs. And what does that mean? Well, what it means is the dentist, um, that, that's how I actually got my start. I got my start because I came out of dental school in 1987 and I didn't know what I knew. My dad owned nine restaurants in four states. I was 10 years old. I had five sisters. We were so poor. It was beyond poor. And he saved up his money and he bought a franchise for a Sonic drive-in. And he was making, I think, about $11,000 a year the first 10 years I was born. Then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he gets his own Sonic drive-in. He starts making $60,000 a year. And at 10 years old, I thought, wow, my gosh, your dad's job and income has a huge impact on how you're going to live. Well, then he opened up one every year for next uh, nine years. He got nine of them. And I um, became a dentist. My, my dad owned Sonic Drive-Ins. My next door neighbor was Kenny Anderson, the dentist. I'd go to work with my dad. We'd make hamburgers and fries. i go to work with Kenny Anderson. And we'd take x-rays of teeth and do root canals and crowns. And there was no looking back for that. But what I learned with my dad for nine years is that you just don't go put a restaurant in the middle of nowhere. First, you do your demographics. So what did I do? I wrote the Department of Economic Security in Washington, D.C. Back then, there was no computers. I graduated from dental school without a cell phone or a computer. That's how old I am. Um, but I don't have an AOL account. I don't. I upgraded to Gmail. Um, so you sit there and um, you look at this. Um, and they said, they sent me back a report. They said the Department of Economic Security thought that between the year um, 1985 and 2000, the United States would create 30 million jobs in five new cities. And one was Boston, too cold for me. One was Florida. I hated the insects. And, and two were in California. And when I grew up in Kansas, you know, it was a very um, you know, Kansas, it, we, I just thought everybody in California was uh, crazy and wild and on drugs and it scared me. And I looked over at Phoenix and 65% of the growth was from the Midwest where I thought those were people I could relate to. And so I picked Phoenix. So then I wrote the Department of Economic Security in Arizona and I asked them for their um, pro, um, projected growth. And they sent me the uh, 70 census, 80 census, 85 mini census, the six year street planning, uh, widening the six year uh, putting in pipes for water in the desert. They, they gave me all their data. <clears throat> so I took a six foot by four foot map of Phoenix, Arizona. I traced out the 303 um, census tracts. And I first started with the dentist per population ratio, which is the most important variable. And sure enough, when I traced out those and I made an index card for each one, um, it started with number one, where I set up my office, which had a dentist for every 6,000 people. And it went all the way to the bottom of a dentist for every 500 people. I mean, I just cannot believe how people, um, you, you, you've never gone down the street and seen nine McDonald's on the same corner, but I'll show you medical dental buildings in every major town that has nine, 10, 12 dentists in one, in one area. So it's, uh, it's crazy, crazy. Um, so, um, so I decided I was going to go to Phoenix. I decided it was going to be 85044. I called up my a broker. His name was Dave Cheatham. I was in Kansas City. I said, hey, the zip code 85044. You got anything to rent in there? And he wanted to push me into medical dental buildings. This is, nine, this is 40 years ago. Now everybody's in retail, but back then it was, it was a new deal. And I said, well, no, I don't want to go into a medical dental building. And he said, well, you're a doctor. You don't need a good location. I'm like, whatever. So I went right next to the grocery store, right next to a Safeway grocery store in the same parking lot as a Pizza Hut, a Chase Bank, a Kentucky Fried Chicken, the whole nine yards. And, and it was just blowout demographics. Um, we were getting about 80 
eight to 100 new patients a month. Um, I was doing direct mail back then. Direct mail, it's still amazing. Now, you carry a lot of your biases with you. So when you're a millennial and you hate direct mail and you don't and you do everything online, um, you uh, might not like direct mail, but I guarantee you that little old lady who might need an implant um, isn't on TikTok or Instagram and doesn't take uh, um, selfies of herself in the bathroom mirror. She still goes out to the mailbox every day. Hell, she probably likes going out to the mailbox every day. It's her event. And direct mail is about a 1% return. So if you need, if you want to place one implant a month, you would need to mail 100 pieces. So when you say 99% of the time didn't work, so direct mail doesn't work, that doesn't make any sense. What is the cost of the direct mail? You're charging a thousand for the implant. What is your margin? Um, is it a return on investment to keep uh, um, advertising? So I picked the great, great location and I was born in Wichita, Kansas, went to uh, undergrad at Creighton University, went to dental school at UMKC, and I was willing to move a thousand miles away from home. I have friends back in Kansas City and she said to me, she goes, but I could never move away from Kansas City. I'm like, your mom moved 14,000 miles from the other side of the world to give you a better opportunity. And you can't even move out into the suburbs or the rural. Like, look out here in Phoenix. Phoenix, Arizona, by the time you get to North Scottsdale, there's a dentist on every corner. Um, and it's just crazy. The minute you get 45 minutes out of town, Maricopa, Eloy, Florence. I mean, we still have cities that don't even have a dentist on there. Um, so um, I, what I don't understand is why couldn't you, um, the craziest thing is when you live somewhere else in Phoenix and you got to commute 45 minutes through traffic to get to the other side of town to Scottsdale. I'm like, oh my God, if you would have got in your car and drove the other way for 45 minutes, you could have found a town of 2,000 that doesn't even have a dentist. And remember, whatever the city town is, you have twice that number is the draw. The town might only have 2,000, but people come into the Walmart and the grocery store and the dentist um, from the draw area and it equals about twice of the urban area. So, I mean, so just be smart. I'm not worried about your $400,000 of student loans. I think as soon as you get a divorce under your belt, you, you will die, you would do anything someday uh, to wish you could get out of your marriage uh, for the price of your student loans. It's not the $400,000, that doesn't bother me. What bothers me is when in supply and demand that your first decision is to go set up and create a supply that nobody wants or nobody's demanding. So um, location, location, location um, is a great thing. Um, DSOs, why have they been so, um, why have they been doing so well? Because dentists don't do demographics. Dentists sit there and say, I remember when I opened up my dental office, I did it for no money down. And all my friends were like, oh my God, I can't believe you went in that place. They charge $20 a month, uh, $20 a square foot a year rent. And I got a medical dental building for only $10. And they paid my build out. I'm like, okay, well, how, how's your cash flow doing? How's your revenue doing? Here's what I did. I went in there, they wanted a thousand square feet for $20 a square foot for a three year uh, lease. And I said, well, okay, well, instead of a three year lease uh, for 20, I'll give you a five year lease for 30. And the guy said, okay, so what do you want me to, why are you doing that? What do you want me to do? And I said, well, why should I come in here and build out a thousand square foot build out when you've built out the whole 16 acre center? Obviously your subs will do it harder, faster, better than um, what some young dental student could find. So he did the whole build out. So I, um, then I went down to the uh, supply house and uh, back at the time, um, it was another company. They didn't really have Patterson and Shine and Benko and Burkhart back then. It was called HealthCo. And I totally picked out everything I wanted just for the perfect dental office. And he said something like it was like going to be like 85000 I remember it was the same amount as my student loans, which is 87000 I said, that's great. But uh, unfortunately, I don't have a dime. So what I want you to do is put all that equipment in my office and I'll make monthly payments for 60 months. And, uh, and when the last payment, I'll own it free and clear. And they said, okay. So here I come out of dental school, I had $87,000 student loans. Uh, my dad wouldn't help me. He paid for my sister's college. He wouldn't pay for mine because it was the girl boy thing back in the past. And uh, he said, um, he said, Howard, if I pay your way to college, you're going to go up there and chase women and take drugs. And so I felt horrible chasing women and smoking pot on student loans. But uh, I don't, I do want to say that I was able to pay back all my student loans, which included a sizable amount for reefer. And uh, so, so my dad wasn't going to help me. 
So I got into a dental office with no money down, zero money down. I opened up my dental office. It opened up on a Thursday and I was all excited to start doing dentistry and nobody came in. And at the end of the night, I thought, oh my God, what, what, what am I going to do? So I called my old man. I go, dad. And he goes, Howie, are you scared? And I said, yeah, frightened. And he goes, that's good. He goes, remember in Kansas when you saw three hungry coyotes walking down a dirt road? You knew someone was going to die that night. He goes, if you're scared, that's good. You'll get out there and hustle. Now get out there and act like you're running for mayor. So what I did is I took a backpack and I got a bunch of toothbrushes and gloves and mirrors and my business card and a schedule. And on Saturday, I got up at eight o'clock. I took a six foot by four foot map of Phoenix and I had every street. I think at the time there were 28,000 people living uh, in about 10,000 homes. And every Saturday I went door to door, knocking on every door and they'd answer. I'd say, hey, I'm Howard Fran. I'm 25 years old. I just graduated from dental school in Kansas City. I'm going to practice here for 40 years. I just thought I'd get out and meet the neighborhood. And about two out of three people thought, oh, well, that, that, that's nice. Thank you. And they took the toothbrush or whatever. And some thought it was kind of weird. About one in every three would sit there and go, early, well, I, I, I roll her. And I'm standing out there on his front porch at nine o'clock in the morning in his underwear and his wife beater t-shirt looking in his mouth. And then I would just, the clothes I would just say, well, you know, what I really need is an x-ray. Is there any chance you could come to my dental office next week and let me take an x-ray of that so I could see what's going on? And he'd say, well, well yeah, what, what, what do you got open? I'd pull out my notebook and I'd say, well, I actually have an opening 24 hours a day, seven days a week until the end of time. Does any of that work for you? And I wouldn't stop until Sunday afternoon, until Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. every hour and a half with somebody that I found on their front door. So it's still always going to come down to get out and hustle. Now I'm going to say something and I call my podcast deadly incorrect and I know I've, uh, I know I offend uh, many, many people, but I, I'm not trying to offend you. I'm just talking to you as if I talk to one of my four sons. I just want to be completely honest, but the people who the only people I've ever seen hustle uh, are the married people, particularly the Mormons. I mean, if you come out of dental school and you've already got a kid walking and another one's in the oven and you know your wife's going to be a stay-at-home mom until the end of time, you're incredibly scared. Those are the only ones that will go to rule. Those are the only ones that will work through lunch. Um, who doesn't hustle? You know that 20% I said that uh, didn't have any student loans, they don't have any debt? You try to hire those guys and they're like, um, hey, I know we close at five, but I got a lady on the phone with a toothache. She could be here at 515. It's probably going to be a root canal, billet and crown. That's 2000 bucks. You want to stay? And they're like, oh, I've been swiping on Tinder all day and I've got a hot date at the bar. They, they, just, they just don't have to work. So it always, success is always going to come down to focusing on one thing. You, you've read the book Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell, where he says, you got to do one thing for 10 years to really get competitive at it. Well, undergrad, dental school, eight years. I mean, you'll only be out of dental school two, two years. You got your decade in. And that's what I, and you already saw that with economics where you specialize on one thing or get a tighter focus. Um, you'll make even more money. Um, so, you know, it's just about, it's just, it, but it still comes down to hustling for a long time for many decades. If you get up and hustle every day, think how hard you had to hustle in high school to get into college, how hard you hustled in college to get into dental school. I mean, I, I went to, I, I did all that. I mean, I, dentists are incredibly smart. I mean, they know math, applied math is physics, applied physics is chemistry, applied chemistry is biology. If you, if you understand math, physics, chemistry, and biology, and you live in the biosphere, I mean, you're equipped to figure out anything on earth. Just stay focused and keep hustling. Um, back to these DSOs, well, what were the dentists not doing back then? They were all going into medical dental buildings and they were not advertising. In fact, it wasn't even legal to advertise until 1973 uh, when Goldberg and Osberg, out of, uh, lawyers out of uh, Tucson, Arizona, um, took it all the way to Supreme Court because physicians, dentists, and lawyers um, and pharmaceuticals, um, they couldn't advertise. And they said it was a free speech violation. So they got that overturned in 73. I got out of school in 87, no one was still doing it. Well, the DSOs are like, we're gonna get a great location and we're gonna advertise. And so they, um, they, they've been growing 
very, very well. What is their downside? Their downside is um, they are not able to keep their dentist. The average one keeps their average associate dentist for about a year. Same with in private practice. So what are we seeing here? If I go to the bigger pool of where associates got a job, um, they only stay with a, a, someone else for a year or two. And then DSOs, it's only a year or two. If you look at the fame stocks, uh, Facebook, Apple, um, Amazon, Netflix, Google, which is now Alphabet, they have the same thing. They have, they have an incredibly high turnover rate. They're giving them big stock advantages and they're giving them the greatest working conditions. And it's still hard to keep someone for a year because say you've done a year at Facebook and someone comes up to you and say, are you kind of doing the same thing every day? Is it just work? Hey, why don't you jump on over to Uber or, or driverless cars? Or And they're just, they're just going where it's fun and they're just moving along. And, um, but it comes down to more of who is a dentist? Who is this proverbial doctor of law, doctor of medicine, doctor of dentistry? Well, they're not the type of people that go to college for eight years always end up being the person that doesn't really like to take orders. If you want a million people to drop and do 50 push-ups and do anything you say, you need, a bunch, you need to go in the military and be a general and have a bunch of 18-year-old recruits. Wal Walmart's the same thing. Um, a, a huge portion of their, of their workforce doesn't even have a high school diploma. Well, that's not you. So when I look at people who have eight years of college, like to look at law firms, half of them work in group and half of them work in solo, and they started doing this decades before we did. Look at the consulting firms, Boston Consulting, Price, Waterhouse, Coopers. It's the same thing. Half of your accountants and CPAs and lawyers are solo, and, and half work in group. There's advantages to group, and the biggest advantage to group is, um, number one, you just don't like business. It's really going to be hard to do, be good at something uh, if you don't like it. Because to be good at something, you're going to need to do it all day, every day for a long time. And, and you can see in dentistry that some people like to do business and other people don't. And so the dentist, like, like how many of you right now have a mom or a dad that owns a dental office? Okay. So I want you to write down this question. I want you to take it home. In fact, tell them this short, fat, bald dentist at school. That way Peter won't get in trouble. And uh, he, he asked me to ask you this. Um, ask him, say, this is um, March 12th, 2020. So in the first three months, how many incoming phone calls did you get in 2020? Or let's just take the first two months, January, February, just cut it clean. One sixth of the year. The first two months of 2020, how many incoming calls did you have compared to the first two months of 2019? They have no idea. How many of those calls were not answered? They have no idea. How many of them went to voicemail? No idea. Um, how, how many of the voicemails were never checked? They have no idea. So your only connection, like, like you're connected to me. I'm in Phoenix, Arizona. It take me six and a half hours to drive there. And, and we're in real time. Well, right now, um, they didn't have this smartphone when I graduated. I think, it, I think it's going to go down in history as changing the world more than uh, anything. I mean, Neil Armstrong landed on the moon in 1969. I was seven years old. I remember watching it. The whole country was breathless uh, for the whole journey. It was unbelievable. And Neil Armstrong had a smaller computer than this. And then in 2007, Steve Jobs plugged the internet into an old Motorola cell phone and came out with a smartphone. And it's going to be our finest century. I mean, when I was um, 10, mom bought us encyclopedias. I was born in 62. I was 10. It was 72. And they were printed in 52. So my first Wikipedia was a 20-year-old set of books. Now, um, and, and all the rules that govern society in the last 5,000 years were all developed when 90% of the people that they govern over couldn't read or write. Now, everybody is smarter. Every, I mean, Wikipedia right now is 70 million pages, and they're all updated daily. So they're going to connect to you, and they're going to sit there, and they're going to surf um, dentists near me. And then they're going to go to your mom and dad's website. And, and it's, uh, does it impress you? Does, um, you? Like, you know your dad. Like, maybe your dad's really into implants. Or maybe your mom's really into Invisalign. And you go on their website, and there's not one picture of anything an Invisalign. None of the cases they did. None of this is the dentistry that I did in my own hands right here in Salina, Kansas. None of that stuff. Yet, look how many pictures you guys take daily. Like, when we were little, 
if you wanted to take pictures, you had to go to the store, buy a pack of 12. You would come back, you'd take the pictures, and you'd take it back and get it developed. You wouldn't get it back for two weeks, and half the shots didn't turn out. Um, now you just take pictures all day long. You're the photo generation. You kids grew up on Facebook and Instagram and all this social media, uh, but your parents didn't adopt. They have no photos of themselves. They have no photos of their work. And here's this smart consumer thinking, well, I got a tiff on this front tooth, and I don't want just anybody to go do it. And then they go to your dad's website and, a, and he doesn't even have a picture of himself. I mean, how ugly are you if you don't have a picture of yourself on your website? And there's no video, there's no YouTube. They can't feel your dad or mom's chemistry. Um, you can't sit there and say, this is the work I did. So what they're buying is a relationship. This is a commodity. What is a commodity? Something that trades on price. When you get a, a barrel a gallon of gasoline you don't care if the gasoline came from alaska or saudi arabia or russia or iran you don't care corn wheat pigs they all trade on price and that's where half the dental market works half the dental market trades on price i got these benefits from job and it pays 100 percent for cleanings exams and x-rays i'm gonna go there and that's a completely distinctively different business model than the business model that says, well, I'm not just gonna let anybody fix my front tooth. I'm afraid of getting a shot. I don't want it to look bad. I don't want it to hurt. I want it to be convenient. I want it to be close. I want to trust. So that's the other half of the market called value added, they pay more. Obviously, both businesses are going to get half the market, but dentists have a hard time doing the low cost provider. Like if a dentist, um, if, if he owned a McDonald's, he, he'd, he'd go to some continuing education course, say, well, you know, people come here at night for dinner. We should get tablecloths and chandeliers. And I noticed on prom night, none of our customers come and they'd start slowly eroding the profit margin by expanding into a, you know, I can get two tacos at Taco Bell for a dollar. or I can go to a sit down Mexican restaurant and get them for $5. Those are two different business models. Like if, if you were going to go where they only show, shop on price, well, amalgam, you can place an amalgam 10 times faster than a composite. Hell, amalgams last 38 years, composites last six and a half years, but your, your professional bias doesn't allow you to see the obvious. I mean, we, fillings fail in your mouth because of the 600 different other life forms of bacteria, erythros, um, um, uh, all kinds of prokaryotes, eukaryotes, fungi. They're all living in there and they all get eaten biologically. Well, hell, an amalgam is half mercury. You'll never find mercury in the multivitamin. It's not very pro-life. And uh, the other half is silver. Look at silver diamine fluoride, tin. Look at tin, uh, um, uh, stannous fluoride, the active ingredient in, in all the hygienists' mouthwash. So an amalgam, would be really fast and last really long with the dentist says, well, I know Medicaid or this PPO, I know they're only giving me $100 for a filling, but I'm, I'm gonna do the nicer one. I, I say, stop, 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 stop. On that $100 for a filling, you walked in that room, you were in that room for half an hour. Let, let's say you did two fillings in an hour. Um, and I want you to ask this question to your dad too. No, no, ask this question to your dad. Th this will be uh, to your mom. She does a hygiene check. And she's had that dental office for 40 years, and that hygienist has been there for half of them. And you say, hey, mom, you just did a hygiene check with her hygienist, good old Bessie. Been there 20 years. My God, you did a cleaning exam and bite wings. Did you net $9.17 after taxes, or did you lose five bucks? Your mom has no idea. She has no idea. She had, I mean, it's just crazy. So now this dentist is in the room and I said, well, what does this room cost for an hour? They go, what do you mean? I said, well, there's 160 hours in a week um, that you pay all your bills monthly, even if there's only one month of February with 28 days, four months with 30 days, seven months with 31 days, your rent is the same, your rent, mortgage, bill, that computer, insurance, malpractice, professional dues, those are all fixed costs that have nothing to do with whether you're open or, or closed. And then you have your variable costs of lab labor supplies that increase or decrease with the amount of uh, um, patients that you're working on. What does this room, what is the average cost of this room um, for last month's accounting? I mean, does this room cost $100 a month, $198 an hour? How much does this cost? And they have no idea. See, if they actually knew and they said, oh, you're scheduled for two fillings, uh, you're on some dental insurance, some Medicaid, some PPO, some whatever, but basically you're going to do two fillings and we schedule you an hour and the room costs $200. So you're going to go in that room for an hour, do two fillings, 
you're going to repair something that's no fault of yours and totally the fault of this person who lives on a diet of Diet Coke and pretzels and, and doesn't brush or floss and dentistry is, uh, for the most part, a completely preventable disease. And you're going to do this for free? Well, once the dentist sees a score, see, I know my homies. They knew physics. I mean, you know geometry. You're probably the only people in California that know the difference between a cosine and a tangent. When my homies see the score and they say, oh, that room costs 200 an hour. And oh my gosh, I'm only going to get 200 in revenue. And I know the most profitable dentists in the world have a 50% overhead. So that means I'm going to do it in 30 minutes. So now the challenge is, well, can you go in there and do two MOD composites in 30 minutes? I know I could do them all day long in amalgam. But the thing is, you got to think backwards. It's the price you get minus your cost equals your profit. Your mom knows the price she gets. She has no idea what her costs are. So that's why she keeps inching them upward and upward and upward because it's hard to say no when you don't know why you have to say no. She doesn't know she's left the profit zone. It's the same thing in, in the day. So then I'll walk in there and I'll take the last month's dental office and the, most dental offices are open Monday through Thursday, four days a week. Um, you know, um, so there's 16 days a month is what the average dentist works at. So by the way, when the average dentist who owns their own practice makes 244 and the average American who has a job makes 39,000. I mean, what's 244? Here, I'll take that out. I'll just take a 245 uh, divided by 39. So you make six times the average wage of anybody has a job. You have a job, you own your own dental office, you're a general dentist making 244. The median American, that means half above, half below, uh, makes 39. So you make six times their money and you only work four days a week. And I mean, and you, 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 uh, and you cry uh, like, like you're, uh, you know, just got back from uh, four tours in Afghanistan. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a lucrative gig, but, but you still don't know your cost. So I'll take all the bills paid divided by 16 days a month just because uh, just get it down to a break even day. So what is your dad's, when you go home, ask your dad, dad, what is your daily break even point? Your dad doesn't know. So your dad doesn't know how many incoming calls he gets. He doesn't know how many of them, the incoming calls convert and make an appointment. Uh, he doesn't know how many go to voicemail. He doesn't know the cost of an operatory for hour. He doesn't even know the break even point for a day. Look what happens when it changes. Like all know this dental office has a break even point of 3000 bucks and it's four o'clock. They close at five and their break even points 3000 bucks and they're going to finish the day at about 280. Now that call comes in at 445. Oh my God, my tooth just broke and I'm in pain. Huh? I could drive straight to your office. You're thinking, oh my God, that's a root canal bill and crown. Root canal is a thousand bucks. That, that, that's a $2,000 on your average PPO. But see, you've already paid the bills. You're in the profit zone. Now you know you're going to stay and make 2000 bucks. It's the same thing as working through lunch. I never, ever took a lunch when I was in dentistry and in my dental office. Number one, you know, um, usually somebody wants to meet you for something. Well, I don't want to drive 10 minutes and then watch you eat for 10 minutes to have you talk for me for 10 minutes and drive back. You know, just, why don't you just tell me why we want to meet and, and just do everything better, faster, easier, higher quality, lower in cost. So the DSOs are doing great is because they know all those numbers. They know all their costs. Um, so we go into the average dental office. For every 100 people that land on the website, only three convert. And the doc has no idea. In fact, your dad couldn't figure out even how to measure that. And you, this is, this is the value added you could do for your old man. If your old man's paying for your dental school, my God, whatever, he, whatever money he gave you, you could earn it back before you graduated. So then you start giving a message say, Dad, how come 100 people land on your website, only three convert? Why don't we take away all this stuff and make it about, why don't we make it about the patient? Because you go on your website and it's a movie about him and all about him and him and him. This person's, you know, they broke their tooth. Um, it looks bad. Um, when can they come in? Where are you at? And, and you keep giving them marketing proven techniques like by the phone number. If you say, call now. They'll just call now. Just like if I was lecturing, if I walked up to one of you and I said, hey, um, come over here for a second, you would just do it. Well, why did you just get up out of here? Why didn't you say, hell no, man, I'm relaxing in the chair. I don't want to get up. No, you just do it. So when the website says call now, they do it. Um, they say, and then split those. 
If you're a new patient, call this number. Well, that's a priority. If you're an existing patient, call this. I'll call you back. I got someone hot, and if I don't answer the phone, they're going to hang up and call the next dentist's office that they, they serve. Um, what about having a video of you on your deal? You can start um, changing anything as long as you can measure and see the output. That's a scientific experiment. Here is our website. We change one variable and the calls either increase or decrease. Then when they call your office, um, how, how come three people have to call? These are the average dental office in America. 100 people land on the website for three to call your office and convert. When they call your office, only three people have to call your office to convert to have one to come in. And then they'll all of a sudden say, well, wh why is that? Well, how, call your own office. Half the time, uh, so if you're open Monday through Friday, eight to uh, five, that's only 32% of the week. So uh, 20, uh, 29% of the, actually I think it's 28%, 32 divided by 168, 32 divided by 168 is 19% uh, of the week. Hell, you, they're closed 81% of the week. That's why no one um, converts that. Look, look at these DSOs, they all have call centers open seven to seven, seven days a week. Why doesn't your dad have a call center? I mean, all you have to do is forward the phone to a smartphone and then you already have a dental assistant. You already have a receptionist. You have dental assistants, receptionists that work in all the other offices in town. Why don't you just sit there and hire one of them to answer your phone call? And then when they call, um, they can close by pulling up the schedule. Our schedule is all digital. We use Open Dental. Everyone's going to Open Dental because it's the only practice management software system that's open. All the other systems are closed. And by all, I mean all of them. If it's not Open Dental, it's closed. And everybody in the future wants to program to you. That's why Google um, Android has 85% um, market share as opposed to Apple's closed system. So you have Open Dental you get a little programmer and he can program anything he wants to it all the new hot little app features all hook up to open dental because it's open and now you forward the phone calls and then now it's your aunt Shirley's answering the phone and she says well when would you like to come in and then if it's a real super duper emergency she knows that the doc's phone number she might be able to sit there and say hey I'm going to drive down to your office I'll open it up I'll take the PA and a bite wing and it's 344 now so if you could just swing by at like four o'clock I'll have the bite wing in the PA on the box and if it's a toothache uh, you know you can do the old deal well well you know the infection looks pretty bad I think that before we do the root canal we should put you on antibiotics until Monday because I've been drinking all day it's Saturday and I really don't want to do a root canal drinking uh, you know I mean people play games whatever this up but you caught the fish you might not have cooked clean and eat it and then they saw that you came down there on a Saturday and you you're hustling you're hustling, man. You went down there on a Saturday. I do this, and then what I do is when they come in, that new patient uh, emergency exam is 250 cash. And then, uh, so it's 250 cash to meet after hours to take an x-ray and have the doctor look at it. I have the lady answering the phone, that's her cash. They, bring, they have to go to an ATM machine, get the cash. So my staff, they think it's really cool. Now, now um, you have to be married uh, and your uh, husband has to be able to beat the crap out of me. I'm not gonna have a woman meet uh, somebody in this society after hours, late at night in a dental office. Maybe they thought there were drugs or nitrous or now surgical masks. Could you imagine getting popped for some surgical mask and gloves in a dental office? Uh, but if their husband is a bouncer and can go with them, they love it, man. It's Saturday. They made $250 for an hour's work, all cash. This is what DSOs are doing. They're mastering locations. They're mastering the incoming phone call. So even though they have this rapid high turnover of dentists, well, let's look at your dad's practice of high turnover. So let's say your dad has had the dental office from age 25 to 65, 40 years. He's got three chairs. He's had the same hygienist for 25 years. Well, if you take that hygienist, times 32 hours a week. Well, see, I mean, let, let's say 40 hours a week for easy math. 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year is a 2,000 hour job. So if a hygienist takes an hour to clean your teeth, she cleans your teeth twice a year, she can service 1,000 people twice a year. But the math doesn't add up because your old man's been getting 25 new patients a month 
for 40 years. That's like a cup of coffee. Someone's just been standing there for 25 years pouring coffee into the cup. So you know every coffee molecule that goes in, one has to come in out. So every new patient that comes in the front door, someone's going out the back door. So the DSOs have a high turnover with their dentist. The private sector has a high turnover with their patients. Why would anybody need new patients after 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years? Because they can't keep them. They don't even know who left. They don't even know why they left. Was it because they needed an early appointment? Was it because they needed an evening appointment? Is it because you, didn't, um, you said that the insurance would pay 100% and then they didn't cover the buildup or the crown and you didn't, and you know, something went wrong. Well, Walmart, Sam Walton measured all of that. In fact, that was one of the big reasons why he wanted to take all of his returns. He didn't want you to buy something from Walmart and it breaks and say, oh, Walmart, they suck. I'm never going back there again. Hell no. He didn't get a measurement. He wanted you to know, we, we, have, we take all refunds, uh, all returns, no questions asked. It's 1% of sales. But why is he doing it? Because he knows your name is Dan, the man, and this is what you bought. And he's going to give you another one. And then Sam's going to step it back to the guy he bought and say, hey, what's the deal here? I'm pushing this up the value chain. We're not doing this. Can you redesign this? Can you make it better, faster, easier, higher cost, lower margin, more profitable or not? So, you're, you're, so DSOs <clears throat> are, are taking over because you're, you're our generation of millennials they, they did, it was all dentist focus. It was all about me. In fact, have you ever heard the dentist national anthem? It goes, me, 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 self, 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 me, me, self, self, me, 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 self, 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 me, one, 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 me. It was never patient focused. I mean, how their hours are eight to five, Monday through Thursday. Why do you think odontogenic reasons is, accounts for eight and a half percent of emergency room visits? Because the real doctors in the hospital are open 24 hours a day. You're open Monday through Thursday, and then you're unlisted and don't take emergency calls. This is why there's only three publicly traded DSOs. None of them exist in the United States. There's two in Australia, one 300 smiles. Uh, the other one is uh, Pacific Smiles. There's one in Singapore, uh, Q&M, uh, on my Dentistry Uncensored podcast. They're all, I've, I've interviewed every Everyone who's everyone in dentistry. Um, in fact, Peter, I want to podcast you so bad. You got your MAGD. You are such a leader in our community. And you can listen to these. Days. They all have the same business model. The business models are open seven to seven, seven days a week. Well, I already know what you're thinking. I, I mean, come on, dude. I've been in dentist for years. You're already thinking, hell, I ain't doing that. Well, I know you're not doing that, but are you going to solve the problem for the consumer and, and have an employee? Are you going to extend hours? And you're going to say, nah, I'm just going to do my own thing. My dad's done his own thing. Okay, well, you're going to get ran over by people who are more customer-centric than you. Um, so th what, what do they do? They, they, um, they're open seven to seven, seven days a week. And all their locations are where everybody's uh, uh, busy, the busy locations uh, going on and on. And, um, and you should watch those three podcasts to see what they're doing. So let, let's go um, on dentistry. I want to talk about um, general dentistry. I was telling you that, you know, the oral surgeons make more. Uh, the general dentists uh, are making less. Well, when we say general dentists, let's break out the specialists. Average endodontist makes three twenty-five. I mean, my gosh, you have to sell cosmetic dentistry. Like if I went into your place and you said, hey, you got to bleach your teeth. It'll, you know, I mean, it, it, imagine me going in somewhere and they're saying, uh, we think you should get hair transplants and some Botox and, and all these, you, you, you couldn't sell me on it. I mean, I'm 57 years old. My four boys have turned into five grandchildren. You can't sell me on this stuff. You have to be really good in sales to sell cosmetic cases. And I notice most of the people that are really good in sales are also hot. Uh, if, so if you're short, fat, bald, and fat, you're probably not going to make it really big in Beverly Hills doing cosmetic makeovers. But look at Indo. They're calling you. They're saying, dude, I'm in pain. It hurts. I can't sleep. I can't eat. If I just drink water, it hurts. They're begging you to come in to give you $1,000. And what do 80% of the general dentists say? Nah, I don't want to do that. 
I don't, I don't like Mueller and Doe. Well, I don't care what you don't like. I mean, we're a 50,000 year old species of Homo sapien. Um, they, 99% of us have lived in the last 50,000 years. And about 108 million, 108 billion are already dead and there's 8 billion alive. So of those 108 billion people, that slug it through life, did their job, and dropped a frog, and you're here today. Um, do you think they might have had to do stuff they didn't like? Could you imagine being stuck in a cave during the Ice Age all winter long, and the only thing you can eat is mastodon crap? Uh, and, and now you tell me, after borrowing $400,000 of other people's money that you don't like endo, you know, buddy, I don't really care what you like. Why don't you go down to the cemetery and tell the 110 billion homo sapiens uh, that you have it worse than they did? Um, oral surgery, 413. I mean, they're just pulling teeth. Pulling teeth is instant satisfaction. I love pulling teeth, but here's what's going to happen to you. You're going to start pulling one and the crown's going to break off. And you won't get out the root and you're, and you just get scared. That's what happens. We're still talking about greed and fear. Like right now, the stock market, that's just the economics of panic. It has nothing to do with the long-term fundamental values of any of those companies. And so the bottom line is you just got scared. Well, when I was 10 years old, I was at my friend's house and I grew up in Kansas, third of my friends were farmers and I got bucked off a horse and his name was Lightning. Uh, I should have been smart enough to know that there probably might have been a reason the horse was named Lightning and you shouldn't have got on Lightning. And I was all crying and everything. And what did my mom make me do? What did she make me do? Get right back on lightning and duty. And so the crown breaks off and you have to have him bite down on gauze and you call your oral surgeon and he goes over to the oral surgeon's office and the oral surgeon pulls out the root and you have your tail between your leg. That's only going to happen a couple dozen times. I mean, it happened to me about once a month for the first year or two. And, and now I pull all four of my wisdom teeth. From, I'm not talking about seating the patient, numbing them. I'm talking about when it's time to remove the teeth. 90% of the wisdom teeth I remove in five minutes. It's because I've done it thousands of times. Orthodontics. I mean, my gosh, how can you not learn orthodontics? They make 301,000 a year. Your mom doesn't know how to do ortho. Ask her why. Pediatric dentistry. Now, I have to admit, if I had to pick between being a pediatric dentist or just collecting unemployment and living uh, in a halfway house, I would, uh, I would, I would do that. I just, uh, there's just not enough money in the world for me in that. Periodontics has changed to um, just, just implant stuff. But the bottom line is you've got to learn um, how to do stuff you don't like. The average bread and butter successful offices are doing seven root canals a month. They're doing almost all their extractions. And then it's just basic crown and bridge and fillings. And, and then I look at your continuing ed. And, and, and here's why I love you. I do. I love my dentist homies. My four boys do too because I've lectured in 50 countries and my boys, they've gone all around the world. And if you go into anybody's home who's a dentist, a physician, or a lawyer, they have 100 books that are nonfiction, science, history, you know, um, all kinds of biographies. They're so smart. And if you go into a hundred people's homes that don't have a doctorate, almost, almost everything in there is uh, fiction. It's 50 shades of gray. It's, you know, it's, it's uh, they, they watch TMZ and there's nothing right or wrong with that. I'm, I'm just saying, I just really enjoy uh, spending my time uh, with dentists. So, you know, they're smart, uh, but they, um, but that doesn't always apply to the, the dental side. They just, they just don't apply it. Um, to where it needs to be uh, in the practice of dentistry. Um, the other thing about being a good doctor is you know the best doctors do a procedure every week. So your dad, I'll look at him, he's real smart, and I'll sit there and say, okay, you're, you're mom and dad, you're smart, you, you, you know what you're doing, uh, you know all the money is in, um, um, you know, what we just talked about, root canals and extractions and cleaning samples and x-rays. So you're taking a week of vacation, you're going to continue ed. What, what is it going to be on? He's, I know what he's going to say. Uh, collusion. I'm going to go to Koi Spear Spanky. Koi, I just want to learn full mouth occlusion and learn TMJ. Awesome. So did I. I did all that. I went to the Panky Institute. I got my mastership in the AGD. I my fellowship in mission. I love it as much as anyone else. But I know when I'm learning TMJ that it's not 1% of my revenue.
I know when you're getting all bent out of shape about this big old problem on this really big case of somebody who wore their dentition down and you're doing a full mouth rehab and you're mounting it on an articulator, that full mouth rehab, I mean, it, it's not your practice. I mean, 80% of your revenue comes in from cleanings, exams, fillings, <clears throat> basic, simple endo, see 90 4% of crowns done in the United States are done one tooth at a time. And it's kind of like when you go to, if you go to the CDA meeting and you want to take a course on implants. Oh my God. I, I already bet you your car. It's going to be about all on four um, because that's what's sexy and groovy and challenging. Well, every time an American dentist does an all on four, they do a hundred all on nuns. And there's no courses on dentures. In fact, when you look at implants place, they're almost always placed one at a time. But see, you're not attracted to that because you learn too much algebra, calculus, and physics, and it's not sexy and exciting to you. Well, it's kind of like this. Dude, you own McDonald's, and you're sitting there your whole life. Every time you take a course, you're going to go take one on steak and lasagna and fondue, and you're going to learn all this stuff. But the bottom line is Ray Kroc owned McDonald's. And he made so many billions of dollars. He owned uh, a baseball team and other things like that. Uh, but he knew where the golden goose was. And the golden goose for you and your future is just like you. Like how many of you right now in this classroom need an all on four? Need the remaining all your teeth? Well, do you even know anybody in your family that needs an all on four? So when I sit there and I go to your family reunion and I go through and I'll survey and, I'll, and, and try to assess what their dental needs are, most of it's just basic six months cleaning exams and x-rays, a basic filling here and there, maybe a crown here and there. And that's not what you focus on. So you're always focusing on things that raise your overhead and don't make you money. And furthermore, um, I've only had two operations in my life. I had a tonsillectomy when I was like five, and then I had a vasectomy after my fourth boy. Um, when I went to get a vasectomy, uh, do you think I would have gone to a vasectomy guy who does one every three months? I mean, uh, no, I would um, absolutely uh, want to find someone that does like eight a day. So get focused. Um, the future is going to be all digital. I don't have to talk to you about that because you grew up digital. I mean, you grew up on Facebook. You grew up on all that stuff. So here's what I'm going to tell you to do. What you need to do is you need to not reinvent the wheel. I've only got two minutes with you left. Um, so I've made everything available for you free. I got Dental Town website with a quarter million dentists on there for free. And it's not like Facebook, which is basically, if I disagree with you, you'll just delete me and ban me. So you get these balkanized deal where no one will uh, say the obvious. Uh, just uh, We see it in politics. You see it in religion. My oldest two sisters are Catholic nuns. I don't think they could join a Facebook group uh, from Lutherans and uh, leave the Catholic church. And, and if they started arguing with them, they'd get banned. So the bottom line, you need to go somewhere where someone can call you on your shit and say, no, actually, buddy, you're wrong. Number two, I have, I have done 1,300 podcasts on dentistry uncensored. So if you take like the greatest, I mean, take, take the greatest of anybody in any field that's ever lived of all time. I mean, my gosh, uh, implants. Uh, I did Carl Misch, Endo. Uh, I did the, the guy who wrote the book, Pathways to the Paul by Stephen Cohn. I mean, I probably did 50 of the greatest people from around the world on every one of the 16 categories in dentistry. We, I talked about all on four, how I podcast interviewed the, the inventor, Margo, Marco uh, Gablo of, of all on four, bone screws. I mean, all of it. It's all there at your fingertips, but you know who's going to do well? It's, it's, like, it's like practice management. You got Daryl Holmes in Florida and uh, in uh, Australia, founder of One Three Hundred Smiles, who's got a hundred million in cash, owns a hundred dental offices, no debt. Really, you don't think he might know something more than your dad? Um, Alex Abrahams, um, he owns the Pacific Group. He's a dentist. Raymond and Q and M. Listen to Bob Fontana. Like a lot of your friends say, I, I work at Bob Fontana. I, I work at Aspen. Well, who owns it? Well, I don't know. Maybe. You should listen to the guy who owns 900 dental offices because you have $400,000 of student loans. Um, Rick Workman, he's a dentist in Effingham, Illinois, who's a billionaire.
He owns a thousand dental offices. And you, and, and here's what I want you to do. I was your age once, and I understand that age. I, I raised four boys. I get it. When you're 20 years old, everybody as old as me is an idiot. I know it. But between now and when you're a grandpa, you will look back and say, maybe Howard knew a little something. He was a, still a strange man, but he did learn something. So what you need to do is keep an open mind. Do you think my 60-year-old Roman Catholic nun sister has an open mind about Catholicism? No. You need to go back when you were a 20-year-old postulant who just walked into that monastery and start listening and taking notes. Because um, if you go to San Francisco, you're in California, on 450 Sutter Street, there's one building that has 162 dental offices in there. I mean, I mean, I mean what was the 100th guy thinking? Well, I think after 99 dental offices in the same dental office, I bet they need at least one more. I mean, I, I look at the county data. The county data, 11% of the counties don't even have a dentist. I mean, if your goal was, I'll, I'll tell you this. If you listen to <clears throat> half of my podcast, if you listen to 10% of them, and I don't make any money on them. I, I mean, it's, it, this, this is my hobby, transferring wealth of knowledge to kids for free. It's what old people do to young people. That, we think it's kind of cool and we think it's kind of fun, but there, if you listen up to at least 100 of those shows and you get on Dental Town and you put your tail between your legs, I know you know everything, but just log on there and say, just play dumb. Say, I'm not sure, should I do this? If you listen up and you just learn the basic 10 obvious fundamentals of economics, of finance, of business, of marketing or whatever, there will be a year not very far away where you will make in one year what your entire student loan indebtedness is going to be. I mean, my God, if you walked out of school, if, if I only made $400,000 this year, I would cry. I would have to, uh, you know, I, I know a ton of people. So this, it's all in your court. The patients won't lose their teeth. Healthcare is the fastest growing sector. Owner operated is better for people that have eight years of college. It's totally your game to lose. So if you sit there and say, I know, but I, my, I was born in Salt Lake City and my, I, I want to open up a dental office. I want to go back home and I want to, I want the blah, 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 then that's fine. As long as you write down what the trade off is. Okay. But there'll be, instead of one dentist for 6,000, there'll be one dentist for 600. As long as you know what you're doing, I don't care what you did. Hell, 92% of all the humans that ever lived are dead. I don't go to graveyards and tell people they did stuff they shouldn't have done. They're dead. It's your life. But my gosh, if you play this right, there'll be no-brainer years where you can take home two fifty dollars to $400,000 a year. And if you had half as much fun listening to me as I did talking to you, you had a fun hour. Thank you so much for inviting me into your classroom. Thank you, Howard. We'll talk some more. All right, Peter. Thank you so much for having me come to talk to your class. It was a huge honor. Likewise. All right. Have a good day. Bye-bye. I'll see you guys on Dentaltown. Download the app. <laughs> Anybody have any questions for Dr. Ferran? You have to come down because the speakers here, or you can speak up so everybody can hear you. Can you hear me from here? No. Yeah, hi, Howard. Hello. Yeah, my name is Eric Strand. I'm a long time fan, but this is your podcast. Yeah, well, like, like a pre dental. Um, can you tell them a little bit about what the AGD has done for you in your practice? That is a most excellent question. Did Peter put you up to that question? Uh, no, I've, I've been uh, leading the AGD here at Loma Linda. Oh, my gosh. Excellent. Best question ever. And, and uh, I named my first son Eric, so it must be something to do with the, the name Eric. Um, so, basically, there is only 24 hours in a day. There's only 168 hours in a week. And humans end up trending towards the mean. Um, 
most of your biggest decisions of your language, your religion, your culture, your politics was all just based randomly of where you were born. So you come out of school and you got five friends and let's say three of them didn't go to dental school and they're plumbers and they're, and the most excited thing they're excited about is the legalization of uh, uh, marijuana and all this stuff. And, and they're always complaining. They just drag you down. So when I got out of school, I took a continued education courses. And I noticed as I was going to the courses that all the big dogs had these little initials behind their name, F-A-G-D, M-A-G-D. So I started looking into this club. Turns out to get an F-A-G-D, you had to take 500 hours of continued education and pass an exam. So I did that. But what I was doing is I wanted to change my, the people I hung around with. It's kind of like when I went into Creighton. I knew when I went into Creighton, I was borrowing um, a lot of money as $6,000 of student loans, and I was scared. And I, so when I checked in on the ninth floor of uh, Swanson Hall at Creighton University, there's 88 boys on the floor. And I was in hog heaven because I grew up with five sisters. And that's why I hate democracy because Monday Night Football always lost five to one to the Big Valley and the Brady Bunch. And we never got to watch sports and all this stuff. But I knew it would be tempting. So I said, you know what you should do? You should befriend the ones who obviously are going to get into dental school. And I really, as I met everyone, it was an interview for my time. And I picked Gary Isoldi, Randy Kerwin. Um, I picked four guys who are still a dentist. Joe Dovkin uh, was one of the greatest endodontists in Arizona who passed away a couple of years ago. I mean, all four, we made it. Well, when you're in that AGD course, like I would sign up to go to an implant course, but I'm sitting next to a guy with FAGD, MAGD, and at lunch, we're talking about this and that. And it turns out the biggest change was I went to an implant course, but I learned something about bleaching, bonding, veneers. It's, it's who you run with is everything. Like if you run with four or five people that just hate the system, they hate the government, they hate everything, they're just, you know, they're just, they just hate everything. It's like, okay, well, if I turn back the pages of every hundred years going back in time, it sure looks like it's getting a hell of a lot better every century that goes by. So there's a lot of things to be optimistic about. And if you hang out with MAGDs, you're going to be placed at implants, you're going to be doing root canal, you're going to have a million dollar practice. I mean, MAGDs are just going for I think it's just the greatest decision in the world but what I don't like about um, some MAGDs is if you want to be a jack of all trades um, the business model is challenging because if you're not doing it once a week 52 times a year you're not going to master it and you're not going to be profitable at it so I think it's great to learn removable that helps you um, with implants, everything cross comes back together. But, but I don't, but if you're gonna be, if you get out of school and you think I'm gonna learn, I'm gonna master endo and pediatrics and Invisalign and implants and bone grafting, and, oh my God. Um, there's 40,000 healthcare journals a month mailed in the United States. Uh, ask me how I know I own Dental Town Magazine and Ortho Town Magazine. I mean, you can't learn it all, there's not enough time. So choose carefully. And a lot of people say, um, oh, you know, I think I attract the wrong type of person. No. Have you, remember, you know physics, it's entropy. It's a random event when an electron fl flying through the sky hits a, a proton that it could bounce right or left. So everybody meets the full entropy uh, complement of people. So it's not who you attract. It's who you decide with intention to keep in your space. Everyone else just eliminates those people from their space. So be very careful of who you spend time with. And I also wanna say that if you're a couple, you look at the demographics. So why do, um, why do what, what is the difference between the women dentists in the room and the male dentists in the room? Uh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, this is totally politically incorrect. So if anybody asks you about it, tell them Peter told you this, not Howard. And uh, how Peter worded it to me was, um, so basically, if you look at all of anthropology through all time, uh, women marry up social statuses and men marry down. If women are going up, men have to marry down. If you're a woman and you're a dentist, 
well, your husband is probably a dentist, a lawyer, a banker. It's very small chance that you're a woman dentist and you married the cook at the Waffle House. But if you're a dentist and you're the valedictorian of your class and you got a 4.0 your whole life and you see the right looking cashier at the Waffle House, you'll marry her. And if you're wondering why that beautiful girl is going to marry you, look in the mirror and count to 10 and then ask yourself, why is that little pretty peacock going to marry me? Because she knows you're a doctor, dentist, or lawyer, and she intends on never working and spending $10,000 a month from 25 to 65, which is $5 million. So women always marry, women dentists always marry a man that has a good job. And if I was, and if I could give any man in dental school class the most weighted advice, it was do not graduate till you marry one of the girls in your class. Why would you pass on someone who's going to have a $10,000 a month job for 40 years only to get who you think for now is the most beautiful woman in the world? That'll go away in about eight weeks and that will cost you about ten thousand dollars a month for 40 years so women just marry smart eh? they just marry smart 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 but here's the thing if you are a woman dentist and you say well i want to have a practice and i'm going to have a kid too so i'm going to have kids and a practice well you got to get the marriage thing even righter because you're going to need support you're going to need a trusted individual who's always dependable who every time you meet them it's the same mood they don't have highs and lows they're not mean and mad they're not all over the place they don't say they're going to do this they're not someone who gets a different job in dental school every six months. If they have no follow through, they're not dependable and you never know who's gonna show up. Well, I know why you're still dating them because they look like Justin Bieber or whatever, or whatever, uh, you know, um, whatever the hot model of the day is. So the bottom line is uh, women uh, are just, my gosh, I, they're just smart. Um, the, the, um, I, the president of the AGD right now is Connie White. Um, she was my teacher at UMKC from um, 83 to 87, and she's the president of AGD. And she talks about openly where, where her class had 160 people. There were only 10 girls. And they were the new ones in the new frontier. And she married a husband and, and that very, very dependable, had a great job, and they raised three kids and got it done right. But man, it, if, you, if you sit there and think, should I work at a DSO so at five o'clock I can go home and be Mrs. Mom or own my own practice? Well, how? First of all, um, if you own your own practice, you don't have to wait till five o'clock to get off. You can just walk out of there right now. I, I, I tell my, my staff says, well, you can't cancel patients. I'm like, I'm pretty sure I own the place. Um, you know, um, furthermore, someday you might get an associate. You might, you might have your third kid and say, you know what? I don't want to work for a year uh, and hire an associate. I think hands down scale, looking back at me raising my four boys and all of them turned out, uh, I'm just, I'm so lucky. And uh, my gosh, uh, I think being an open, an owner operator after school, they could come down and stay in there. I, you, I don't think dentists, physicians, and lawyers have the personality to take orders very well. So I'm always uh, into owner operator, um, own your own business, control your destiny, but men, you do some crazy, crazy things. And who you choose as your wife has got to be the most weighted, dumbest decision. I mean, I've seen, I could give you 10 names of the perfect Boy Scout dentist. Who, when they got married, I said, well, where did you meet her? In a prison? I mean, it's just, uh, it's just amazing uh, what visual handicaps uh, the, a mate can do to you. So join the AGD, uh, get your fellowship in the AGD, start hanging around with like-minded people. And the most like-minded people are in your class right now. I mean, when you're going home at night and you're all stressed out about the overhead or this or root canal, who better to share it with than someone who's also a dentist? And I look at some of these dental dual teams, whenever I find an office that's like collecting four or $5 million a year and they're taking home a million, it's always a husband and wife doctor team. And guys, I'll tell you this too, guess who quits working first? She does. And I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, so just be smart, make smart decisions. Any other questions? Come on, give me your best question. Come here. Right here. 
Hi, Dr. Fran. Um, my name is Peter. I'm also a big fan of yours. Um, yeah, I watched your 30 day dental MBA, the one you posted in 1999. I watched that, I think twice within two weeks. It's oh funny. my God. Yeah. Dr. Connie White. Cause I just met her last weekend and she got me to sign up for the AGD. I talked to her for like 30 minutes at the, um, at the ASDA conference. Uh, I have like eight, nine questions written down for you, but I don't think we have time to answer all of them. So I guess I'll I got do all eight or nine. Do, do uh, it. No, there are way too many. Um, well, but, we'll start, start a thread on dental town and I'll add someone dental town. Then we'll get scale out of it where other people can chime in. Yeah. So I just have two main questions. Um, I guess first, so I could ask you all these other ones. What's like the best way to contact you if we can? Well, so, I, you know, you can always email me, Howard at dentaltown.com. Howard, that's my only email I have, and anyone can always email to me. But what I like to do, I like people to post it on Dentaltown for two reasons. Number one, then oh, it's kind of like developing FAQs. Everybody else gets to learn, but not everybody agrees with me. So then you would get to hear what everybody's opinion was. So you could email me, Howard at dentaltown.com, or start a thread on Dentaltown and forward me the link to the thread you started. All right, cool. And then have you, I know you, um, you interview all these dental grades on your podcast. Have you ever thought about throwing a dental student on there too? Yeah. On the podcast? Yeah. yeah. That, that is another deal. Why don't, you, why don't you come on the podcast and ask me those nine questions and we'll do a, a Q&A from Peter. Peter, the podcast. All right, cool. Q&A. Okay, I'll send you an email then. Yeah, send me an email. Tell them uh, that, uh, yeah, we'll do that. would be a great format for these questions. All right, cool. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Anybody else? Okay. Once again, Dr. Howard, thank you so much. And, thank uh, you. Peter, do I ever get the honor to podcast you? Sure. One of these days. Certainly. Oh, I know you're the busiest honor. man in town, but if you ever got time, I'd sure be an honor to podcast interview you. It would be my honor. Okay. Thanks again. We'll talk tomorrow. Okay. Bye-bye. Hey.